So solar activity overall follows a cycle of about an 11-year pattern. So where we have periods of very high activity with lots of sunspots, and then periods of almost no activity um, and no space weather. So right now we're just coming out of a prolonged solar minimum, but we really haven't had much for significant activity since something like December 2006. So we started to get that first signs that the sun is waking up, and we've had some, some significant events lately, and uh, as this continues, we'll climb up to kind of solar maximum, or kind of the, the peak in activity around mid-2013. Uh, so space weather plays out in a number of different time scales. The first piece, the solar flare piece, is really instant. When we're measuring it, our geosynchronous spacecraft, it's here, it's affecting the Earth. The next piece that comes with that is the radiation storm piece, so energetic particles impinging on satellites or astronaut in space. That can come in tens of minutes. The last piece is, is the piece associated with the coronal mass ejection, a large part of the atmosphere being blown off of the sun at, at really fantastic speeds. So coronal mass ejections are one part of space weather that gets a lot of attention. So that's where a cloud of mass, billions of tons, is being ejected from the sun and coming towards Earth. So this can come off at anywhere from one to five million miles an hour, making that 93 million mile trip in anywhere from 17, 18 hours in the fastest of cases up to several days. And these are huge, huge eruptions. So if you could see the whole heliosphere, you could see that it's affecting a third or a quarter or even approaching a half of the heliosphere. So we're, we're constantly pushing the bounds of, of how well we can model and predict space weather. So there's a lot going on in, in academia. Uh, we've, we've done a good job of getting models now into operations that kind of describe when will a, a CME, that large cloud of gas that gets ejected from the sun and, and affects the Earth, when will it get here? How will it hit us? The range of customers for space weather products is really quite varied. So we have kind of a, a flare piece, that, that electromagnetic piece that affects the sunlit side of the Earth. And that's, that's important to HF communication users. So if you've flown on an aircraft across the Atlantic or the Pacific, uh, chances are information was being relayed to that aircraft through the use of HF communication. We also have a range of customers in the satellite arena. So radiation can be created in these storms where charged particles have the energy to pass through satellites. So that can cause uh, the memory in those satellites to become corrupted. So satellite providers have to be very careful you know, not to upload a critical set of instructions try to load new software or do complicated maneuvers because it could be corrupted even leading to the loss of that asset. Uh, the same is true for our, our partners at NASA with uh, humans in space. These, these same charged particles can pass through humans causing biological damage. So CMEs can cause very large geomagnetic storms. Some of the most important customers for that are people in the electrical generation industry. So people who are generating the power and responsible for trans, transmitting it around the country. So those storms can cause uh, large currents to be induced in their systems, causing heating and even damage. So if we can give them an advance notice to say tomorrow uh, we're going to have a big solar storm, they'll do everything they can to put themselves in a, in a robust posture. So if they have three high voltage lines that you, they usually use to transfer par power from one part of the country to another, say they've taken one out for maintenance, they'll go ahead and put that third one back in service just to give them a little more margin to be able to, uh, to absorb the solar, solar disturbance.